You got a match? They look good. Well, thank you for letting me be here tonight and speak about my favorite topic, mobile homes. Tonight is going to be interactive. So if I ask questions, please answer them. If you have a question about what we're talking about, ask it. You don't have to even raise your hand. If I do think we need to move on with time, we'll do that and I can stay late and answer questions there. I want to quickly go over though what Lifestyle REI is. This is my education platform that I am teaching from what my mentors taught me. I'm teaching from my success and my failures, bringing sunshine and joy into your life. And it's also my platform for like my friends that run successful real estate businesses but don't really want to like get into the teaching world. I'm just saying, hey, come in, teach, and go back and do what you love. So that's what this is about. Well, tonight we are going to talk about why mobile homes, my journey, and I want you to learn from it. We're going to go over the three main ways to invest in mobile homes, marketing, financing, and we're going to put all together a case study. But before we do that, I want you to quickly jot down three things that you are going to do when you're done with money. I like to call it when you beat money. So just three things that you want to do, it doesn't have to share with anyone. Just write down three things that you will do when money is not your thing you're going after anymore. So just jot three of them down real quick. Doesn't have to be in any order. Three things that you will do when you are done with money. Now, raise your hand if one of your items has to do with spending more time with people that you love. That's it? Okay, we got a good amount. Okay, now we have more people. Yeah, we, we have some husbands and boyfriends getting punched right now, I see. <laughs> what about people that want to do more traveling? Anyone want to do more traveling? All right, we have a lot more people wanting to travel than spend time with people. <laughs> but lastly, who wants to help more people out? So most of the room rose, raised their hand for two and three of them because most of us want the same things. I happen to use mobile homes to get me there. It's my widget to get me that freedom to be able to spend more time with people I love, travel, and help more people out. So let's start out with why mobile homes. Oh, by the way, I have nothing to sell tonight. I just want to make sure, because sometimes people are like weird and like at the end, is he going to sell? And there's nothing I have to sell. So why mobile homes? Why would you sell a nice home like this? Does anyone know the investor that says this all the time out of Madeira Beach, Florida? Does anyone happen to know this guy? Name? All right, it's Peter Fortunato. He's an old school investor, but he always asks this question. He tells everyone to ask this question. Why do you think he always says that? Any guesses? Motivation. Motivation, yep, because we need to know why they're really selling. We're problem solvers, and it's hard to solve a problem if we don't know what the real problem is. People don't always just want cash. There's a problem there we need to solve. So why would I sell a nice home like this? It had good bank financing. I'm oh, sorry, it appraised for $200,000, and it had good bank financing. And most importantly, it cash flowed. So why do you think I would sell a nice home like this? Guesses? Divorce, downsize. Invest in something else. Invest in something else, like maybe the topic I'm here for? Yeah. To buy mobile homes, right? <laughs> Paid actor. Yeah. I bought seven mobile homes. I did what's called a 1031 exchange. The simple part of that is I deferred paying my taxes to a later date. Sold the one to buy these seven mobile homes with the dirt. So that's a home and land together. Seven different properties. I spent $174,000. Quick math will say I took some of that money and spent it. I live off my real estate. There are times I did snowball, so took all the money and put it right back in the business. I encourage you to, as soon as you can, take at least a little bit of money, go to a dinner, celebrate each win. There was one little time that we took and went to a fancy dinner every time we had a closing. Somewhere would not normally go. You gotta celebrate it. So as quick as you can, start taking some of that money out and, and live life today. How much do you think I spent on rehabbing all seven of these to get them rent ready? What are your guesses? 120,000. 35,000. 35, I wish that was the number. <laughs> it was $50,000. I spent 50,000 to get these seven rent ready. 
But that's not the reason I sold that one home to get these seven. The reason is the new net cash flow. $3,300 a month. But would you rather have $4,600 a year or almost $40,000 a year? Any, no one? $40,000? You want 857% more cash flow. Cash flow is one of the reasons I invest in mobile homes. It's one of the reasons. A little bit about me. I grew up in Plant City, Florida. It's central Florida in between Tampa and Orlando. Does anyone know where that's at? Yeah. You're shaking. Oh, we got a decent amount of people. So we're the winter starry. What? Dade City? Dade City, yeah. We're uh, about an hour south of Dade City. I used to go cycling there a lot. We're winter starry capital of the world. I grew up there. I'm actually a Florida native, so it's a rare thing in Florida. But, uh, parents, like most of you, that loved my brothers and I, or still love us. They're still around. They still love us. I think most parents want the best for their uh, children, like their childhood dream, but for their children. And we weren't spoiled, but we had a lot of nice things. And we, we traveled, but we weren't spoiled. I, at least I don't think we were. Well, one night when I was eight or nine years old, I heard a lot of like loud noises yelling from my parents' bedroom. So I crawled through the carpet and went over and started listening in. And the topic wasn't good. It was about money. And like I said, my parents didn't really let us feel that stress. But I later found out that we had a stack of credit cards like this that were maxed out. And one night at dinner, our parents let us know that we are filing for bankruptcy. To this day, my mom does not say the word bankruptcy. She calls it the B because it's embarrassing. My parents brought us up to have very high integrity, and we said we were paying those bills, and we didn't. So, you know, if we like it or not, life goes on, and it did. And a few years later, I turned 18, I moved out, I stayed local, but then I was renting a place with some friends, and I was not a good tenant. You already kind of heard I was being evicted. Here are a few of my eviction notices. <laughs> Now these eviction notices are for parties. Mud wrestling parties, spaghetti wrestling parties, pudding wrestling parties. We had fun. The middle one there, you can see a little highlight, that's for parking a motorcycle in the living room. You do not rent to 20 year old Adrian. Now why would we park a motorcycle, sorry, why would my friend park a motorcycle in the living room? That was not me. The parties might have been. Well, for those of you that haven't been to Florida, Central Florida, in the winter, in the morning in the winter, it, it can get cold, like 45, 40 degrees. <laughs> I'm serious. That's why my friend didn't want to park his motorcycle outside. He said he didn't want to wait for it to warm up. I'm not joking. <laughs> the landlord didn't like it. But what happened there? We were getting evicted. I'm a problem solver. So I bought a house. There we go. Bought a house. Was it his house? No, it was not his house. I bought the house. What did I do next? I took all my friends that helped me get evicted. I moved them in. <laughs> I said, no motorcycles inside. Well, the important thing I did is I took my mortgage and divided up amongst my friends. So I lived for free. And they paid my mortgage. I said, this is pretty cool. Why don't I do this again? Bought another house. And that time, I, I'm still listening to the bank, that's all I knew. And I was losing a little bit every month, but the bank said, it's okay. You'll refinance in a few years and you'll be all okay. And a few years came along, the value was going down of the house and I had adjustable rate mortgage. Yeah, so my payment was going up. I went from losing a little bit every month to a little bit more. And then within a few years, I gave up. I gave the house up as a short sale. That cycle came back of memories of my parents' bankruptcy. I compromised my integrity again. At the same time, I hadn't worked about six months. I was in a marketing and big businesses cut marketing pretty fast in a recession. 
But that was the time I learned the value of real estate. Out of all of this terrible time, because I didn't lose this house right here. I bought it right and I was renting it right. And I didn't lose it, even though I hadn't worked. So I got back into real estate. I found myself at a RIA just like this. Fell in love with the educational speakers, the networking part of it. And that's where I learned about mobile homes. So I bought my first mobile home. Who wants to hear about my first mobile home? Sure. Yeah. All right, I love the interaction. So I'm at my RIA. I met someone there, Jessica, we became friends in one of the meetings. She's like, Adrian, my broker has someone that needs to sell their mobile home. Do you want to look at it? I said, sure. I didn't have any formal education about them. I had heard some of the seasoned investors talk highly of them. I went and looked at this three bedroom, one bath, 1965. It had pretty much everything wrong with it that people tell you not to do. The septic's under the back porch, you go through one bedroom into another, that's all an illegal addition, all these bad things. But I was uncomfortable being comfortable, so I had a pretty good house, good life, but I knew there was more of one of those freedom stuff we talked about earlier. So I decided to spend basically the rest of my savings and I bought this for $16,000. Made a few more mistakes, but then eventually got the for rent sign in the yard and got $4.75 a month. It's a pretty good return. I heard someone quit. That's a good return. What did I do next? I went and bought more. <laughs> I realized I stumbled into a gold mine. So I started buying more of them. Today's business is we buy single units. So that can be a single wide or double wide. It means there's one unit on a parcel. I own the dirt and the home together and we rent them out. And that is the main business today. That's what the success has gotten me. I started teaching around locally, then teaching all around the country, decided to write a book to get more information out there faster. But the real thing, the mobile homes with the land renting them, that predictable income has gotten me, is the freedom to be where I want, when I want, with who I want. So this is when you have to interact some more. Okay, first of all, who wants that freedom? All right, there's, you don't want it? Okay, okay. I can always find someone that's just not gonna raise their hand I can pick out. All right, because that's what we're really here for. I mean, we wanna help people as well. There's that side of it, I get to help people. But we want the freedom for ourselves. The, he mentioned about that selfish thing, what are you really looking for? You gotta tell people that. All right, tell me, which is the manufactured home, which is the mobile home, and which is the trailer? Take some guesses. Out, out loud, just. All right, technically you're right, but this is kind of a trick question because my answer, my answer is if I am buying it, they're all going to be trailers. I don't care what year it is because it sounds real cheap, doesn't it? And it brings the perceived value down. But if I'm going to rent it or if I'm going to sell it, it's going to be a manufactured home. I don't care what year it is because it sounds stronger and more expensive. So our words matter in everything we do, and we have to use the right language. Who is a little nervous, scared about the idea of investing in a mobile home or a trailer? Good, we got a few honest people here. Throw some reasons out, why? Life cycle. Life cycle? Okay, any others? Depreciation. Clientele? Depreciation? All right, we should be able to hit all of those tonight. If not, ask afterwards. Three ways to invest in mobile homes. You can buy just the home. This is typically inside of a mobile home park. You own just the aluminum box. You pay someone lot rent every single month. Some areas call it space rent, but you don't own any dirt. These are really good ROI, return on your investment. These are recession resistant. The reason these are no longer a big part of my business is because I lost control. The park manager gets to make all the rules. Quick story on that is I had two of them in the same park. The park manager sends us an email on April 5th saying, you can no longer have any homes in here that you don't live in by the end of the month. I can fight it maybe. I don't know, I don't put my energy towards negative stuff like that. I sold them. I was fortunate, I sold them for a profit. I bought them right. Rented them right for years and I actually sold them for a profit. So it worked out, 
but it was a little gut check of like, I don't have control in here. So I made a lot of money, but what if that was my entire business plan? Because I don't like giving up all the control, that's not a big piece of my business anymore. Another way you can do it is you can buy the whole park. Andrew's got some parks. These are no longer in my vision because of a few things. Now, these can still be great investments, but I'll tell you why they're not in my personal vision. There's a lot more government regulation. This is going to be different in every municipality, but around me, my friends tell me about all the inspections, the fire department's there every year. Uh, if you have a septic plant, you have that. You have wells every single month being tested. Some areas, they even check the homes every month. I'm not against all that, but I just have to get paid more because I have to do more work. The other reason, if it's a big one, let's say 100 units plus, the big parks, the hedge funds got in there years and years ago, and they have cheaper money than us, so they're paying a lot more. The competition is really strong there. Some friends that are in that market tell me that they're only making money on syndication fees. If you're gonna go that route, just know you're gonna have competition. Obviously, there's, there's money to be made in everything, but just know there's more competition. The reason I stick in the middle is because there's less competition. There's less people doing it. I buy, I get that control because I get the land. I have a single unit, it's this forgotten little niche. I still get a great ROI, the return on the investment, recession resistant, and there's less competition. Less competition means I don't have to work as hard. Now, let's look at a few of them. These are some of the single wides, or single units with the land I own. You can see that bottom one there. It came with the vintage yellow countertops. If you wait long enough, everything will come back in style. That's what I say. That's what I hope for. That unit also had shag carpet. So anyone my age or younger, shag carpet is this really long haired carpet. There's actually a rake to stand it all up nice and pretty. It's, I, I think it's probably so the parents knew what the kids got up late at night and walked through the living room. But what do we know about shag carpet? They're really not installing anymore. So we have original carpet, right? In the 1960s and 70s. What do I know about the subfloor in the 60s, 70s, and a little bit in the 80s? It's made out of particle board. Who's gotten particle board wet? What happens? <laughs> yeah, it swells up and disintegrates. It falls through. It's glued together sawdust. The floors felt strong, but I knew I had to have particle board underneath. So now I need to be able to put it in my budget to replace all the subfloors. It's not that expensive. It's not that hard even to replace the subfloors. It's really not any different than a wood frame helm. But if it's not in your budget, it can hurt the bank account in a few months or years when your resident, tenant, I call my tenants residents, by the way, if I interchange those words. When they spill something or decide to mop or whatever, I don't know why they'd mop shag carpet, but if they replace the floors, covers, and it disintegrates, it's gotta be there in your budget. Working on mobile homes is not that difficult, but it's a little different. Now, these are really good ROI and recession resistant. Why do I keep saying recession resistant? <laughs> Louder, I couldn't hear you. I, I think it's because of the tenants. I, mean, I think some, some of the tenants uh, may be, um, uh, have government vouchers. Government will always pay, so I think that would be a part of it. Uh, okay. I think you know the rent may be a little more uh, affordable. Okay, I like that. What, what do you got? Pretty much what you just hear to say about the rent being more affordable. You know, there's certain people who usually uh, scale back with their rent, but it costs more expensive. So. We got some koozies for you. You two are, are on the right spot. So we, There's affordable, no was it? There's no debt. No debt? There's no, you don't, you don't own a bank for a lightning. No debt, that, that, that's not the only reason, but yes, I am not a complete debt free guy, but I do like very low debt in comparison. We're gonna talk about some financing, but that's a smart move in any area. But, Yes, ma'am. There's a huge demand for affordable housing. Huge demand for affordable housing. Exactly. So what's going to happen? Well, what do I think is going to happen? When we have a recession, if we're in a recession, whatever your definition is, it's going to happen at some point. Let's say we have a two-household income. They're making just enough, maybe a few extra $100 a month. One of them loses their job. 
they're probably going to have to go down a level. And that's going to continue happening until we get to that affordable housing space. I don't know about here, but where I'm at, we already have an affordable housing problem. We're not really making any more, so we're going to have more demand. We're not making more supply. So textbook, textbook economics says we can raise our rents. I'm not planning on the fact of raising rents. I like the idea I'm going to have a larger applicant pool to make sure I'm always going to have someone in there, not only to pay rent on time, but to take care of my property. So I'm not putting myself in a position that I can't pay my bills again. So I'm not going to let that cycle happen one more time of compromising my integrity of not paying what I say I'm going to pay. That is one of my biggest reasons right now of why I've sold off all my site built and really moved in to the mobile home space. Most mobile homes are in our affordable housing space. I'm not asking you to sell all your properties and only buy mobile homes. But I would like you to consider adding some to your business so that you can have a recession resistant business. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Let's now look at who lives there. Somebody said this earlier. This is who you think lives in mobile homes or trailers, trailer trash. This is what the movies make fun of. Country songs like to make fun of them. And it's a fun joke, but this is not the only person that lives in mobile homes. Every kid does not come with a tall boy natty light. If you zoom in, that is actually a natty light. <laughs> it's not true. Who lives in my properties? The blue collar, handy man, and handy woman. That is who I'm looking to attract. That's a whole other topic for me, but I basically looked who, do, who has been my best residence over years, found my avatar that I want to live in my properties, to be, be the blue collar, handy man, handy woman, so I do everything to attract that person, including buying where they want and what they want. This is the painter, the electrician, the roofer, the contractor, the road construction crew, people that are making a lot of money right now in Florida because of the hurricane, the jobs that really never go out. And it's not uncommon for me to drive by a property a few months after we give it to someone and they have planted plants and decorated because they take pride in their home even if they're renting it. It's their home and they take pride in it. So that is who I look for. So did I bust the myth that it's all trailer trash? Did we get rid of that myth? Cool. Because we got to get rid of those myths so then you can unfreeze. Wasn't that the term that you used, Andrew? The unfreeze and be accepting to new ideas here. How do we... Oh, oh no. My thing missed. Uh, all right, I didn't set the thing right. I was going to say, how do I find most of my properties? But you can see postcards underneath there, bandit signs, MLS, all of that can work. All the traditional marketing works. This is how I find most of my properties, though. I go to RIAs and realtors. You did networking before everything started. You just had two minutes. Hopefully, you're going to do more afterwards. Who met someone new during the two minutes? Oh, awesome. I love all the hands. When I am in my local market, because that's where I buy, I am like a broken record. I buy mobile homes. I buy mobile homes. People are tired of hearing it, but I got to keep reminding them. I tell them over and over, and there's always someone new that comes up to me after and is like, why would you buy mobile homes? You have trailer trash, and they go down in value. They're terrible investments. You know what I say? Look at the bill. You're right. <laughs> Send me all your leads. <laughs> and they do. And I pay them. Because if I pay you, who are you going to come talk to again? Me or someone else? Me. I love paying people because that means I'm making money. And believe it or not, they usually don't ask for very big bird dog feeds. So I pay them more. I try to pay them double. Make them really happy. Other investors can be great lead sources. Now, realtors. We know realtors get paid on the closing price, right? Well. Mobile homes usually have one less zero, so they're going to make more, less money with the same amount of work. A lot of realtors don't want to deal with it, or they don't really understand them real well. So I became an information source to realtors. I go to lunch and learns. I go to continuing education. I am not licensed, and I still go to continuing education because I'm an education junkie. 
but that's where the really serious realtors are. People aren't gonna spend time and money if they're not making money as a realtor. And from my experience, it's usually a pretty close knit group. They know most of the room. Well, when I walk in and I'm this new person, they wanna meet me and I tell them I'm here to give you information about mobile homes and I give anything they wanna know. And every once in a while they call up and say, you know what? I don't really wanna deal with Sally and her $25,000 mobile. Can you just help her out? Of course I can. So they became a really good lead source. Do I keep the realtor in a deal? Yes. They did work and I want them to get paid. They deserve to get paid. I don't believe in cutting anyone out of a deal. I want everyone to get paid. Besides that they deserve it, people come back to you if you make sure they get paid. Now, I am a walking billboard. Everywhere I go, I am in my yellow shirt. I am a highlighter at all times. But I have fun with my marketing. One of my friends a few months ago asked me if I got tired of marketing, because I'm always marketing, he said. I told him, no, I have fun. Obviously I like attention, or I wouldn't be always wearing a yellow shirt, have crazy jackets and everything. But I made it that my personality, I'm out there having fun, and then people see my shirt, and they're like, well, what is that about? You actually buy mobile homes? And now they always think it's something about hiking if they're not in the real estate business. And I tell them, well, you're not my clientele then. <laughs> but I'm always out there. I made it my personality. So the introverts in the room are looking at this and like, I can't do that. I would never do that. That looks crazy and scary. Don't do it. If you're an introvert and you, this looks scary to you, don't do it. Find something that is your personality and use it. Dog lovers, cats, uh, Star Wars. There's something that you really love and passionate about that there's a tribe of people that are going to love that use that and make it your little niche. Now quickly I will show you uh, this guy right here. That's Charlie, that's the motorcycle guy. And in the top left corner there, I'm holding the little baby up in the Simba Lion King pose, that's his son Parker. And the onesie does say, my, my parents' friend's wife buys mobile homes. <laughs> Why does it say that? Because I like to have fun. <laughs> I hand wrote it for an hour because I have fun with my marketing. And then the young lady in the middle holding my book, that is my second grade teacher. That I go to yoga when I'm at home at the YMCA and she's always in the yoga class and I told her I'm writing a book. I'm probably the last person that you ever taught that you would think would write a book. She didn't deny that, so I assume it's true. And I wanted her to be at my uh, book signing whenever I did it locally. Now in Florida, we can swim most of the year. Remember, our cold days are 40, 45. I like to go swimming, but I always have to be marketing. Consistency is so key to marketing, and I like attention. So what do I do? I'm not gonna wear my shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, you're right, you've seen this before. Paid actor, man, I told you. If you like it or not, you are going to remember this. This is, this is not a choice anymore. You're going to remember me. So one slide, you remember me. Memorable marketing costs you less money and less time. If you can find a way to be a little different and memorable, people will remember you and you spend less money and time. Who's ready to move on? <laughs> Usually I get a bunch of deep voices. <laughs> Yes, sir. He doesn't want to move on yet. He wants to ask questions right now. I can't unsee that. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. You ready to move on? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Financing mobile homes. Who thinks Bank of America is going to finance this beautiful 1962 that comes with most of its siding? No, yeah. It's not going to. Let's quickly talk about banks. The big banks, they say they will finance the home and land together if it's within the last 20 years. I don't use them, so let's put big banks aside. Community banks and credit unions, they have told me that they will typically go back to a magic year, 1976, 
June 15th to be exact. That's a very important year in mobile home world. That's because the federal government got really involved. They brought HUD in and said, we're going to have a standard quality here. They didn't up it a lot. They kind of got rid of the uh, aluminum wiring and did a few things, that, but that was the biggest code change year. So that is one of the important years. If you plan to use bank financing, please go talk to that bank. I have too many people that call me and last minute and say, I can't close, the bank is saying that it doesn't qualify, or this or that. Or they are fixing flipping it and their end buyer can't close. Every community bank is gonna have its different rules. I tell you right now, that is one of the rules that year. They're probably gonna care about the peers, that they're up to code. I can't tell you what code is here because it changes every municipality. Um, straps and tie downs, that's probably gonna be one of them. They're gonna want those up to code. If it, they're skirting, there's different rules. They can make their own rules. But go and find out what that is. If you plan to use a bank, now, you are lucky because your hard money lender is only the third one I've ever found in the country that says that they will even look at lending on a mobile home. So if you do, you need to have an exit strategy because you said short term. So if your exit strategy is that bank, you need to have already talked to the bank. But if you do plan to fix and flip or do some type of cash out, you have an option with hard money. It's very rare from going around. They understand them enough. So let's put banks aside. Let's pretend like you're out of cash because cash runs out pretty quick, especially in growth mode. How else can we finance this? Owner financing. Owner financing. You've seen my slides. <laughs> Usually I have enough time to get a sip of water there. So owner financing. That's how I got this property. I actually went there to talk to Paul, which is the seller, not with number one goal of buying the property. I learned something in class, and I said, I'm gonna just go try this new strategy out. And then he said yes. I was like, cool, it works. Owner financing, why does owner financing work so well with mobile homes? Well, these older ones, they already know that there's no bank financing. I don't get the excuse of why don't you just go to a bank? On, on newer ones, people will push back with that. The 60s and 70s, which I've bought a lot of 60s and 70s, never had one person say that. They already know that. And a lot of the homeowners in them, they bought owner financing. So a lot of them already understand it to a degree. Now, a little pro tip here, I don't ever say owner financing. Never use that word. I use the word payments, because it sounds simple. And financing usually implies interest. And payments doesn't bring up the top of, of interest. Yeah. And I'll pay interest, but I'd rather start at no interest. It's, it's a better number to me. So I did get 0% on this. So, and he was more excited to sell it to me than I was. And you're judging a book by its cover here because the inside wasn't that bad. Why did he sell it to me on payments? Because I went there. What, what, was your, what were we going to say? I was just going to say because we have to go through the hassle of trying to find a buyer. Uh, he had some other offers. I went there and built rapport. I asked that question. Why would you sell a nice property like this? You have to remember our words matter. And just talk to him. Paul's in his 70s. He had found that he really loves his cafe that he opened up, but he gets here at 4 a.m. and he's not usually done until 3 in the afternoon. And he's the old school investor that goes and physically works on properties. So after working 11 hours, in his 70s, do you think he felt like going and working on this? No. And the other investors talked down on the property and how much work it needs. That really talked down on him because he's the guy that did the work. So they were insulting him without realizing it. So our, again, our words really matter and building that rapport with people is so important. He was so excited to sell it to me on payments. How else can we do it? Because owner financing is not going to work for everyone. We know that. What else can we do? Private money. Private money. Private money. That is my other way. Now, private money, people in this room, you say expensive? Well, you, you need uh, better friends. <laughs> no, it, it can be expensive. Well, let's, let's quickly talk about that. It, it's expensive if you don't value it. 
I just paid off some private money, and the only reason I really did is rates are going up, so I'm like, all right, let me get cheaper. I had him for five years at 17.5%. That sounds like a lot, right? He brought all of the money. I had zero dollars in it, my first private money lender, and I was making 300 and something dollars a month with zero dollars in it. Pretty good deal for me. Excellent deal for him. I paid him a prepayment penalty, and it, his yield is 18 point something. We both made out fantastic. So it sounds expensive, but if the property can yield enough return, it doesn't really matter what we pay. Now, that the same property? No, that's not the one. I, I went off on that little tangent because he said expensive. Um, that one I did fund with private money as well. Um, at the very beginning, I didn't have a lot of proof of concept, so I had to build people's trust. Now I have a lot more of that, so I have lower yields that I pay out, um, but it can work. If you have the right property that can uh, put out the right amount of money, the most important part, it's people that know, like, and trust. So it could be people in here. It could be people in other networking groups. Uh, my insurance guy is one of my private money lenders. One of my friends, his lawyer became. Uh, he's in New York, so they do a lot of their closings through lawyers, and his lawyer finally said one day, he's like, I want in. Like, he sees all of it. He's like, I, I want to give you some money. Doctors can be, that can be another good source. Think of people that know, like, and trust you. And another little hack is I'm posting on social media all the time. I found out earlier this year, what I was doing without realizing it is I was showing all of my friends my credibility over years. I'll post about tonight. I post about education I go to. I post about closings. I post about problems. I post everything. So whenever I was talking to one of my friends that has never lent money before, he already trusted me, but he didn't have to even ask about my business because he's seen it for years he's been following it. So social media, if you plan to use it, it's been really well for me for buying stuff, but also for telling people about my business so then when it's time to give me money, I gave them an opportunity, then we do that. All right, let's get back on track. Private money, we talked about they know, like, and trust you. Uh, there's two big reasons. I think private money is a massive topic, except for it's a really simple topic, because it's just terms we, we go over. But it's massive because every private money deal I've done has been different. If I've lent money or I borrowed money, I've never had two the same, because it's, it's a different property. I'm in a different spot. The economy's in a different spot. My friend is in a different spot. And because we're both humans, we can talk. And I like paying the human better than I like paying a bank. I just personally like it. A bank feels like a bill. Even if it's a mortgage, I'm paying a property off, it just feels like a bill when Bank of America is getting a check. If I'm paying a friend, I know that friend's life. I know I'm helping their retirement. I know I'm helping whatever they're saving for. I know the story behind it. And it just feels good. Another reason, if I got three deals today, I'm an email away from funding them. That's why two biggest reasons. It's easier and I know where the money is going. That makes sense? Okay. So who thinks there's no mobile homes around here? Anyone? No? Everyone thinks there's mobile homes around here? Awesome. I, I, I agree, but I usually have at least a few people in the room that are like, no, there's not any. You're lucky in Florida. Well, there are. So I quickly went to Zillow this afternoon. I really just went there, put mobile homes, manufactured homes, what they call them, and put the recent sold, and there are 3,500 recent sold, and that looks like it's probably, what, 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour from the city here. They're out there. There's a lot of them out there. There's 3,500 missed opportunities. You don't need to buy that many. So just look out. Everyone here already says they, they believe they're out there. There's a lot of them out there. So just keep your eye out there for them. So let's go over a case study. Cragmont, I bought this last year. How do you think I found this property? Driving. I'm looking so I'm driving. <laughs> what else? Your shirt. My shirt, all right. Any other guesses? Facebook, what up? Craigslist. Wait, 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 what, what was it? Friends. 
Yeah. I'm networking. I told you I buy all my properties through networking. For years uh, in the past, I was at a networking event, a business one. I needed a mobile notary. I stood up and said, I need a mobile notary. Somebody gave me Rachel's phone number. I called Rachel. Rachel has done many, many, many mobile notaries for me. Every time before she leaves, she reminds me, Adrian, don't forget, I'm also a realtor if I can ever help you. So how do I reply? Don't forget, I buy mobile homes if I can ever help you or any of your clients. So Rachel brought me this property. How did Rachel find it? She found it through Facebook. Somebody said Facebook over here. She posts on Facebook, not one time and she's done, and not 17 times a day. She reminds people at a moderate pace. Somebody messaged her and said, I have a friend that needs to sell their mobile home. Can you help them? So obviously she could. She told them that she knows someone that buys properties just like this. Actually, what was wrong with the property? Let's talk about that first so then you know what is just like this is. You said you can't even see it. So yeah, it's overgrown. They're not taking care of it. You can kind of see that blue tarp on, on there. You can't see real well. There's a brown tarp on top of that. So we got two tarps. The picture, yeah, it actually was. It, it actually did not damage the inside the, with the water. Well, you, the picture doesn't show you. It's in probate and they want to move now. So they've got some motivation to sell. So she tells them, I know someone, I have a friend that buys properties just like this. If you want, we can see what his offer is. If you don't like it, we can just put on the MLS. He obviously liked my offer. She did that to help, but what did it actually do for her bank account? Any guesses, realtors? She got both sides of the deal. She got both sides of the deal because I'm not gonna talk her down on anything, remember? So she might have been able to sell it for more, but he didn't want to go through that hassle. But she actually made more money by giving him options. So problems we solved there. How do we pay for it? Private money and a little bit of my own money. We put both in into it. Repairs. Everything we talked about on the outside. The inside is a three bedroom, two bath. We had to do both shower walls. We had to repair. We had to repair where the tree limb came through the ceiling. And that was about it. It wasn't in that bad of a condition inside. And then we put it for rent. This was the beginning of December we put it for rent at $1,610 a month. Now, beginning of December is usually not the best time to put something for rent. There was a family in there by Christmas because there's demand. In Tampa, that's I wouldn't put that in the affordable housing price, but it's still on the lower side of the medium price for uh, rental. There's people that want it. It's a quarter acre. It has a fenced yard. It has a carport. It's in a really good location. If you look at the map of Tampa area and you see I-4 and 75, it's right in one of those corners. But people like that because it's convenient. Mobile homes don't always, people think it's a massive discount on rent. If you have the right one, it's not. Who want to see the numbers? Yeah. Yeah. All right, you really want to see the numbers. All right, we paid 83,500. At this time is the most I had ever paid for a mobile by over double. But I wasn't concerned or scared because I have a proven process that I've done before. I just kind of put the numbers in and it looked good. Then we had to put a little more money into it. We have $105,000, 105,600. $105,600 in it. That's the total amount of money in this property. And then I borrowed from a private money lender $70,000. Is everyone right here? We're good to go on? I, I want to make sure before I move on. Yeah. And I see you taking pictures. Uh, I can give you my slides later if you want them to. So $35,000 uh, pocket. See, I was asking if you're, you're ready to move on yet. $35,600. You, you didn't have your calculator out. You're good at math. <laughs> So that's how much I have out of my pocket. That's my money in it. Why did I pick 35,600? I had money. I had that cash. Three years ago, I wouldn't have done this. I did not have the cash. I would have either borrowed more money or wholesaled it. Three years from now, I have no idea what I would do because I don't know what financial spot I'm going to be in to be able to do it. For me, the goal is not to always have zero dollars in a deal. I've done those, but that's not the goal. 
And the goal is not to have the best bragging deal every single time I do it. The goal is to help the seller and make it financially profitable for me of where I'm at at that moment of my business. And we're always changing where we're at, so we have to analyze the deal for where we're at at that moment. That sound good? So what do we have now? We have that, and then $795 of net predictable income every month. That's after all of our property management fees, uh, insurance, repairs, um, mortgage, everything. That's how much comes into my pocket every single month that I can go spend. And then that means we're getting, I'm not sure if you already had the math done, 26% return. My 35,600 is making me a 26% return. That means every single year I get 26% of my money back. Is that a good return? It is. I think it is. I would do it every day, every hour, every time I can get one. The stock market over the long run is about an 8% return. Definitely not this year. Why do we want a large return on our investment? Because we can grow faster. We can get to those goals we talked about even faster. And we need less money. 26% return on my money and big chunks of money in my account. That is a big part of why I do this. The icing on the cake on this deal is it has equity. So I bought it right, I'm rinsing it right, and if I want to sell it, I can sell it right. And this was last year when people in my area said, there's no more deals out there, you can't find anything. And I spent no money, I spent a lot of time because I network, but I enjoy networking. I like talking if you can't tell. That's how I found it. But what does this, all this mean? What do we learn from this? That mobile homes rock. They allow us to be where we want, when we want, with who we want. And I call that lifestyle freedom. The secret here is I'm not only selling you on the idea of mobile homes, it's the more important thing of the benefits the mobile homes give us. The freedom to be where we want, when we want, with who we want. Now, who thinks that this is repairable? This is my friend Mark Bracey. He's in Jacksonville, Florida. This is his daughter scratching her head, looking at this like, Dad, what are you going to do with this thing? Does everyone just think this is like, you just throw this away? There's, I, I would never buy anything like this? Depends on how much I can give it for. Well, he's a fix and flipper. He owns rentals, but he's, he's a fix and flipper. He's a, the best mobile home fix and flipper ever met. This is the end product. Wow. Yeah. He knows how to fix and flip mobile home. Now, he started out as a contractor working on them, to, and then he's now the investor that hires a contractor. He's been at it a lot of years. He's done over 130 of them. But this is what can be done. If you can be able to see that, I don't have the eye for that. I can see it, what can I rent it for. <laughs> but they can be repaired. All right, it's time to take action, though, because you can come here every single month, Listen to whatever the topic is, go to the coffee meetings, do all of that. And if you don't ever take something out of it, I don't know, if you just enjoy coming and talking, but you need to take something and do something with it. Uh, I always encourage people to take one or two nuggets that you wrote down and put action to those. And then if you have more time, go back to the list. For me, when I had this long list of notes, I was like, all right, I'm gonna implement all this. And then I was overwhelmed and never did anything. I know every time I take action, I do it with a wiser approach because I learn from the action I just took. A few of my favorite quotes when it comes to taking action are, the price of inaction is far greater than the cost of making a mistake. If you're doing nothing, it's gonna be really hard to get success out of it. Every successful person I have studied, they take a little bit of action and they trip and fall forward and they get up and they take a little action and they fall forward, take a little action and fall forward. There's an awesome book by John Maxwell, Failing Forward, on that topic. There's no just straight line. Where you are a year from now is a reflection on the choices you make today. If you wanna close your eyes for a second and stop taking notes and just imagine a year from now You've bought a few mobile homes. 
You've increased your cash flow and time. Maybe you've dropped down to part-time. You've maybe quit altogether. Or you're just doing a few less rehabs. Essentially, you have more control of your time. When you get done tonight, you check your phone, and one of your friends sent you a text, and it says, I know it's last minute, but tomorrow's my birthday. Is there any way you can go to lunch? And because you control your time, you can say yes. Maybe that lunch cost you a hundred bucks. You bought food, maybe a few drinks. I'll tell you from my experience, it's worth more than a hundred dollars to be able to be there with my friend. And my friend Morgan, I know it was worth more than a hundred dollars because I was one of the only people that could make it. You can do this if you take action now for the future. You just have to take that action. All right, open your eyes up. We got one more quote by one of my coaches. Uh, he actually is, well, semi-local here now. Uh, he moved a few hours away because he's living his vision. Your actions prove your faith, Ken Holmes. What he means is if you are not taking action, you don't believe it's possible for you. And I'll tell you, that's just not true. <laughs> the old saying, if I can do it, so can you. Remember I wrote a book last year? I was in remedial classes all through school, and last year I found out I'm dyslexic. So if a dyslexic guy can write a book, and a dyslexic guy can buy mobile homes, you can do it too. If I can do it, so can you. I want to thank you for trusting me with your education. This is my information. You can scan that or go to adrians360.com and connect with me on social media, send me text messages. I am way better responding with text messages than I am with uh, phone calls. I might reply in a few minutes, it might be a few days, it might be a few months, but I am much better through text message. <laughs>